it's so nice to see everyone here. I know a lot of you were with us last week and Dr. Eyal Boetzer went through a presentation that stimulated a lot of discussion and questions. And from there, we have assembled key panelists who are experts in their field. And we hope that we can share some of your questions and direct them to different players who have assembled in the room today, which is really exciting. So I wanna say welcome. My name is Samantha Weaver. I am the director of the AOMT, and it's really my privilege to be able to facilitate and moderate these events on Saturdays. And that's what we've created here with a study club called the Mayo Coffee Clat. So we can gather around, talk, and share ideas in an informal setting, drink coffee, or if you're in Europe, you can you know, move on to the other beverages. Um, what we thought would be helpful would be just a recap of what we went over yesterday. So we're gonna do a summary and a all you can share your screen. Very exciting that we have so many people who are so interested in this. And many of you have written, um, we have your notes and your questions um, in tow shared my screen and it's so good to see so many familiar faces in this cute crowd and i would just go quickly on the what i would say some of the important part of the lecture and you can watch the whole lecture on this website so let me start as i said there are many good uh, topics to google as uh, continuing education to the lecture. The lecture was meant to be presented to the Israeli ENT society. However, the, the lecture was postponed so many times because of the COVID. And I wanted to present it to this crowd and maybe get some more ideas how to get the message through to the ENTs. Only some of them are with us on the same page. So let's talk about the fact that the tongue, the proper tongue function is crucial for craniofacial growth. It shapes the palate and controls the size of the airway. Some of it uh, with proper feeding, swallowing issues, breathing and sleep apnea, posture, speech, behavior, and many other systems. I could even say uh, the nervous system, some things like the, the uh, parasympathetic uh, system, now, this is something I got from Irene Markazan that shows and demonstrates how the tongue function can shape the palate, how the palatal, uh, the forces of the tongue on the palate can get a wide uh, palate. The tongue tie issue is very, very prevalent. Some articles that show that it is between 34 to 46% of newborns. And I want to describe again the vicious cascade that may happen from a malfunction from a, some kind of a, a, a mal, an oral dysfunction like as tongue tie. So if we have a tongue tie on a newborn, he will have issues with uh, improper swallowing of the amniotic fluid. His palate is going to be high. He will have impaired breastfeeding, probably transferred to bottle feeding, which is not as recommended as breastfeeding. You will have a high narrow palate, probably mouth breather, and these two things affect each other and can lead us to serous otitis media, meaning ear infections, and the kid with the ear infection will have impaired hearing, will have pain, you will have difficulties sleeping at night and deprived of, of sleep. Other issues can be sleep disordered breathing, because of the high narrow palate and the um, lymphatic system, which is enlarged. And this kid will be snoring and sleep apnea and probably present some of ADHD-like symptoms and much more. The diagnosis should include anatomy, function, and symptoms. I really recommend the work by uh, Richard Baxter, the tongue restriction questionnaire, which will help an ENT to screen their patients. 
And treatment of a tongue tie is a teamwork. It must include the structural, behavioral, and neural systems. And myofunctional therapy is crucial. As I said, I'm with the LiPro device, and this is a tool that can help to replace the fingers for the tongue exercises as part of the myofunctional therapy. And we'll go over the small uh, diagram here that shows that myofunctional therapy, meaning strengthening, here is the tongue, but the all oral environment before the surgery, sometimes maybe even instead of surgery, if you get good function, and then following the surgery for another period of time. Now, the take home message for the ENTs should be that their patients is actually a functional failure because of their recurrent ear infections, meaning something is wrong there, feeding issues, breathing issues, tongue posture. You could, well, an ENT would not treat the body posture of the person, but posture is another. Uh, Thing that the tongue position may control. They should look for tongue tie in every patient of theirs and look for, because of the very high prevalence, they should try to evaluate it before surgery, before the ENT surgery. And if a patient does need the ENT surgery, then they should consider tongue release in every surgical patient. Consider, I wouldn't say release it, but consider it for every patient and rule it out. And then if it is decided to have the surgery, then I think a better thing to do would be phrenectomy with sutures or uh, there is a glue, cyanoacrylate glue may be preferred because we don't know what's the function of the, part of the patient. And if we are just, they are just under surgery and nobody did any myofunctional therapy before that, and tongue movement is not ideal, then we may have a reattachment. So I suggest phrenectomy with sutures for a patient that has no myofunctional therapy before the, treat, the, the surgery. And again, each patient should receive myofunctional therapy before and after surgery to make sure there are nose breathers and have con correct tongue posture following the surgery. And I think this is the summary, the highlights. Now, Thank just you. so everyone knows, you can see the full lecture on the AOMT Facebook page. And we wanted to get everyone kind of reoriented and on the same page here. And it's so important because we know how many functions are involved and how many specialties and disciplines. So to that end, we have assembled a, a stellar group to share some insights into what we're also looking at from other disciplines as well. Um, Robin Glass is with us, occupational therapist and at Se Seattle Children's, Michelle Emanuel, occupational therapist, Katrina Rogers, speech language therapist in the UK, working specifically with pediatric dysphagia, Dr. Silky Weber, ENT from Brazil. Dr. Kevin Boyd, are you here in um, a dentist, pediatric dentist in the USA? And excited that Roberta Martinelli, who is the author of the infant lingual frenulum screening um, protocol and 24 papers just that we received and are assembling in a, uh, a folder for all of you. She will be joining us and uh, it's really people like this who are helping us understand the impact, but also how to talk and collaborate and how to communicate better so others understand what is at risk. I wanted to um, ask some of our panelists, what, which area of function in terms of development, I think it makes sense to look at the infants. And Robin, we were on the phone recently and you made a really good point. And it's, I think we don't have the solution yet, but understanding what the elevator pitch is for ENTs in terms of the collaborative nature, how we communicate, what's the two minute elevator pitch to understand all of these issues. 
Um, do you want to explore what that means in context, Robin? Well, you know, I work in a very big uh, medical system and we see, I see patients both inpatient and outpatient so that I'm dealing with practitioners both within our hospital and out in the community. And many times we are having just a moment to discuss with um, the provider, with the attending on the patient's um, care about I see this baby has a tongue tie. I'm seeing some functional impairments, but many of the people we are beginning to dialogue with come from a point of view of that they're already skeptical. And so many of them, I, I'm sure all of you can relate to the fact that you're walking from one patient room to the next and you run into the attending that you've wanted to talk to about this patient. And you have a few moments to say some really cogent things about why you think this child should uh, have a release. And I would love to have sort of the three sentence bullet point that would make um, a difference in that situation. You know, they talk about your elevator pitch because you only have the ride of the elevator to get your information out, whether you're raising money or connect, collaborating or connecting. So I think it would be a great exercise and I will be, asking you what you think the elevator pitch is in a Google form, because I think we can actually come up with one that can start to include aspects. It's not a quick fix. It's not something that you just come up with. Hollywood studios and writers, they, they take teams of people to come up with the elevator pitch to raise millions of dollars. So I do think this is a process that we can kick off together. And I also think that you are in the trenches and a lot of people don't understand what is at play. And certainly the parents don't understand what the risks are. And it's only you as the provider that's really helping them understand. Mark, did you wanna add some things? Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to add, I've been on this uh, journey uh, for, a little over 11 years, maybe, or coming up on 11 years with uh, Roberta Martinelli, Irene Marquezon. Roberta was doing her PhD. We were all sitting around at a founding meeting for Brazilian Myofunctional Therapy Society. And like, it was amazing. Roberta was gonna do this PhD on a uh, validated inspection form, you know, frenulum inspection form. And we were like brainstorming. And we went on this journey together as this ad hoc public health group that led to the passing of 18 laws requiring frenulum inspection for newborns. And uh, with a national law, the Testudilum Winguinia uh, in Brazil, uh, passed in January 2015, uh, became effective uh, not long after that. All babies born in Brazil are supposed to have their tongue tie inspected or their frenulum inspected in order to avoid myofunctional disorders that would, could follow throughout the lifespan. Not just feeding difficulty, but potentially sleep apnea, potentially language issues, postural challenges, you know, occlusion problems, you know, with that high neuro palate. We have all of these issues that develop, and this is really a public health crisis. So this panel assembled here today has been talking for actually uh, several years now on what we can do to coordinate efforts around the world. I see James Murphy on there as well. He's been a part of this. So Robin Glass is, is uh, I just wanna give a little context. Robin Glass uh, wrote and edited one of the seminal textbooks for creating the field of occupational therapy and advancing it uh, around pediatric swallowing and feeding. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to have her passionately engaged in this process. Ayal Boatser has done over 20,000 frenulum surgeries. He has been involved in really critical pieces of research and he's gonna be switching his career to dedicate to research uh, more than 80% of his time. We, we are coming together as a group, Roberta Martinelli, who I mentioned, 
Uh, Michelle Emanuel is really uh, has so much to share with uh, intervention with all of the comorbidities that can occur from challenges in this area. Katrina Rogers is uh, one of the foremost pediatric dysphagia specialists in uh, the UK. And she's just been asked by Rutledge, Taylor and Francis, CRC, to edit the, uh, what will be a founding or, or really a leading pediatric dysphagia textbook. And I imagine some of these panelists will be contributors as well. Um, Silky Weber is a pediatric ENT uh, and sleep specialist. She's a, a professor at UNESP in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And she has uh, been a, a champion of myofunctional therapy, uh, tongue tie inspection, and she has been on policy committees that have helped set standards of care for major medical bodies like the European Respiratory Society. So we have a, uh, and Kevin Boyd is a, a thought leader in pediatric dentistry and early intervention. Uh, he wants to dedicate his life, has dedicated his life to intervention at the earliest age possible to help the most amount of people. And of course, being a pediatric dentist and uh, really a, a pioneering leader in early pediatric orthodontics, these questions fall into you know, his daily existence. And so we have this great panel to kind of filter these questions that Ayal has brought up. What do you need to do to look at the pediatric ENT and get them engaged? What should you share with them? So these are all critical issues that we collectively, our institute, our, our group here have a, a lot to share. And uh, uh, Samantha Weaver, who's an amazing teacher, leader and moderator, she's gonna be helping us guide through uh, these this next hour or so. So uh, um, Kevin, I you wanted to share a little context about our passion, our dedication and our collaboration uh, on what we wanna, uh, Envision, which is really about helping babies and helping uh, those babies who grow up throughout the lifespan. Kevin, as the pediatric dentist um, also included, and I know you just wrote a blurb here, what do you, what is at risk in, from your perspective? And I know that's a loaded question, but there, I think this is where your passion and urgency catches fire to understand what you see and what this is doing to the shape of the face and beyond. Yeah, well, Al and I are, you know, we're both pediatric dentists and it really is imperative um, that children be seen on or before the age of one. Well, uh, OMDs, you know, obviously they can start in utero, certainly, you know, if the uh, first dental visit, establish a dental home by age one. Um, but even our academy, they were not trained in our residencies to look for OMDs. It's, you know, caries, plaque mediated disease, you know, caries and um, gingivitis and, you know, other anomalies. But this is not really a big part of the curriculum. And you know, myself and, and there's there's more pediatric dentists coming online that are really making this part of our infant oral health exam. Um, and again, I had mentioned there, we have to look at, at three dimensions, not just, you know, the deep palatal vaults and the V-shaped arches, that's important, but there's two other dimensions in which if we have suboptimal um, struct, you know, function of, of the tongue and, and rest position, we're going to get long faces, long face starts early. Um, and, you know, these are... Uh, 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 and sagittal problems. You know, we have a suture between our canines and our laterals. It's where the Laporte surgery is done. And that is patent, just like the mid palatal suture. Lick your tongue on the roof of your mouth. That's, the, that's your mid palatal suture. Those are very patent in babies. And that tongue properly functioning uh, and resting in the right position, you know, in the roof, on the spot, that is going to push the mid face forward. That is going to prevent the face from lengthening and the, the maxilla from falling down and the, you know, consequently the mandible. Um, so much to do here to reverse or, or prevent 
OMDs, orofacial myofunctional disorders. So that, that's really um, what I see is um, everything. This, these, these lectures are beautiful, um, Al. They're, they're just, I, I'm so glad you're here and doing this. Um, I wish more of our colleagues in, in pediatric dentistry, general, general dentistry, orthodontia, ENT, you know, it, it's a schlag. It's going to take a long time, but uh, uh, this is, we just got to be persistent. So sorry, that's a little verbose, but uh, you know, that's where I'm at with it. Um, <clears throat> well, I know that I added, I sent out a form and a lot of people are confused about the, the preparation for phrenectomy and not just sending a baby in and why it's important. And I know there are classes and lectures and lots of more information around this, but if somebody is just hearing the myofunctional therapy aspect or the preparation for the release, Michelle Emanuel, can you share what that means just so everyone kind of understands and why that's important. So you're asking um, why we should do optimal timing of release for babies? Yes, and what that means, yes. Well, let me start with what it means. First of all, it's, it's really not that black and white because there's a lot of human variability and a lot of different factors that are playing into not only the baby, but the parents and the family factors. Um, the other one is that, you know, it's a little bit of an intense process to have a tongue tie release and a, a month of wound care and a lot of new things. And we're at a very vulnerable time when babies tend to be um, immature and we have a very powerful amount of also neural development going on. So <clears throat> why would be because we want babies prepared and we want them resilient for the procedure. We also want the parents prepared for what's gonna happen afterwards because the wound healing that takes place is, um, it's a very, I mean, I find it fascinating as I've done some wound care even before this um, as an occupational therapist. And I find it very interesting from that perspective, but just managing the wound is a whole topic itself. And um, also because as mentioned, babies are, you know, they all has nailed it so easily for us. You know, they're I call it prenatal oral dysfunction. It's like they're already doing the maladaptive strategies and what they're swallowing is amniotic fluid. And towards the end of um, a full-term pregnancy, the baby and their swallowing abilities will help regulate the amniotic fluid level. Um, I'm getting verbose a little bit like Kevin, oh, but what it, what it is, is looking at each baby individually and taking into account, and I've broken into five categories with multiple characteristics, and I get, I get really nerdy about it, but basically is like looking at the baby and kind of their symptom list and how many comorbidities. And you're looking at a baby that has a lot of dysregulation and has a submucosal tie and has a small jaw and is um, having a lot of GI irritability, like adding another thing to the plate at this time isn't really good. So we're looking at their level of function. If things are mild and it seems like, you know, we can go really fast. It's not like we're waiting for ages and ages. Optimal timing is still happens rapidly within days to weeks to perhaps a month or more, depending upon the situation. There are a lot of those, but it's really taking each baby as an individual. So it wouldn't even be like, if it looks like this, do that. Um, so it's like individualizing it and doing a functional assessment and seeing like what can be improved upon. I think that's another thing that's not really well known is that babies can make a lot of improvements with therapy. And we want babies to be able to make those improvements so that we go into the release, they can go even further. If we release them earlier, it's really hard to, to see what, <clears throat> what was what and you know, ferreted out. And I've just, you know, for many years, I saw suboptimal outcomes. It was like, they were okay. You know, things got a little bit better, but I wasn't satisfied. And so I started doing a little bit what I considered optimal timing and I have more words for it now, but it was really just uh, looking at each baby as an individual and kind of having a, an idea of when they're ready. And um, so thank you for asking me that.
Well, you have a whole, uh, I mean, there's so much more to it. And I know that that's something that it keeps coming up. And I think uh, providers don't really understand what that means. And so maybe that's part of the elevator pitch. And I am creating a Google form for people to start to write what they think right. uh, to be included. I've I mean, been talking about optimal timing for a while though. Like, you know, I did, um, you know, the American Academy of Laser Dentistry asked me to speak about it two years ago. I spoke about it at ICAP um, in Toronto. Um, I've, you know, the whole group cranial nerve dysfunction oral restrictions has been, has been around this issue of looking at what's the functional ability. And I have three categories, mild, moderate, and significant. And so when you have a baby that's significant, you know, they really need special attention. And even, even with moderate, we need a little bit of attention and the milds don't. So this is what makes the story of tongue tie really confusing is that um, we don't have like a specific objective measurement or anything standardized. And that's why I keep hanging out with you guys because you're raising the bar and you're bringing the excellence. You get all these people together who are amazing and put these put the brain trust together. So um, it would be nice to have something a little bit more concrete, but this is again, where we lean into our team. And so I don't think it's always on the release provider always, if you know who you're working with and you can trust their assessment and you can trust their referrals. I think that can be really helpful too. And so we got to open up the lines of communication within the whole team. And um, I think that will help as well. But we, we really, I mean, I think that people think that I'm not for release at the hospital and I, I totally am. I think that's like something completely different. So I want to say that as well. Um, I, I, Robin, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I think um, as we look at what Michelle has been saying, I think we can um, think about the continuum of the issues. One is someone has to say, here is a tongue tie, here is a functional problem. And we're not getting all providers, in fact, to identify that. But then the next piece, as Michelle brought up, is, is this baby ready at this moment? We have so many babies who say, our insignificant failure to thrive, that may in fact not be the moment to release. They may have to artificially in some way improve the nutritional status to allow the baby and the family to um, go through the procedure. But I wanted to throw in one other little wrinkle that I see that's sort of tangential to this because I work in the NICU a lot of the times as well as outpatient. And many of our preterm babies, because of the kinds of medical procedures we are doing, particularly in respiratory support, high flow, uh, CPAP, all of the ventilation, they actually are starting out life with open mouth posture, whether or not they are having a tongue tie. And I really see this as a very significant effect of moving forward. And so I, you know, I'm not sure how we can put this all together, but I do think for our babies who are preterm that we are actually setting them up for a whole host of other issues later in life by the virtue of how they begin uh, breathing early on. And yeah, that's so well said. I don't think also what we look at and also Robin as an OT, I know you can appreciate this is the sensory processing aspect and how our, our whole, as a baby, what we do and what our sophistication is beyond our social nervous system is we organize around our mouth. And so this is a really important time for that. And so we wanna do these really important procedures in a time when it's right for that baby. And <clears throat> that's why it's important to have them working with someone beforehand who can help you know, can help do that. The outcomes are just way better. And I'm seeing it with my own eyes. I don't, you know, I'm a little bit, and that's why I joined here too, because collectively here I am in private practice. I'm a power of one. I really have very little means of my own together. We can do this. And um, that's why I'm so glad that AOMT has dedicated to bringing OMDs, not only to toddlers, but to babies and to look at when we can really intervene the best. And um, you know what I've seen is when we do optimal timing too, is the releases are better and the outcomes are better immediately because you can get a better release. And 
um, a lot of that has to do with, like Kevin mentioned, the jaw, the size, the shape, the position, the tone of the tongue, and, the, and obviously the position of the tongue, but it's the tone too. And where does tone come from? You know, there's our breathing capacity and our nervous system regulation. Katrina, do you want to add some of the, the dysphagia element in these cases? Because Ayal brought that up in his lecture and it, it really was, if you all watch Ayal's pr presentation at the end, it just is a punch to the gut around how many interventions are being considered when the tongue tie had never been considered. And so uh, Katrina, in your field as in swallowing, tell us what you see. Um, I apologize for the noisiness. I'm in a very noisy space in central London, but um, just bear with, bear with me. Um, I, I um, just picking up on Robin's point there. I think that actually when you're looking at babies in preterm infants and special care, we see a lot of babies with issues very early on. And I think that those babies that I see who present with tongue tie on top of all of that, the tongue tie is the last thing. And as they're discharged into community, it's left. And I think that those babies then really have a difficult journey and it can be really difficult to transition them of tube feeding um, and, and support their feeding, support their breathing um, and, to, and to bring them back. You know, they're the babies who have had tubes all throughout, like, throughout their early start. And I think that we do have a duty there to, to address that. Picking up on Michelle there, you, you know, the, the uh, uterine studies that are carried out, you know, there are a number of studies out there that highlight three markers for dysphagia. Um, some of that is linked to, you know, is linked to tongue tie, but other things are the genetic problems going on. And really, it needs to start early. We can safeguard some of these children and these babies um, to, to, to support them. But in my experience, and certainly within the National Health Service in the UK, the journey is long and there isn't the specialisms and the expertise to support them. And so I really um, find it brilliant to be part of this international group because it's something that is very, very important. And, you know, all the early documents, we've got the first thousand days, We've got other government documents um, underwriting the NHS is early, early support, uh, good nutrition to support good health and development. And I really do feel that we're letting some of these children and babies down um, with this. Um, yeah, just to pass a comment, I, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you. And Silky, Dr. Silky Weber, I, as the ENT, uh, can you shed light on what might be some of the barriers between a community that you're working inside and new information and the, the research levels potentially? Um, what do you see as kind of the challenge inside your community? And you've obviously built bridges outside of it. So I'm curious as the ENT here. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Silke. I am working in Brazil. I'm very happy that I can participate on this story. I think we had done already some very nice discussions together. Um, as Mark already said here in Brazil, we should be in a more lucky situation as uh, the Ministry of Health approved a law for newborns to be assessed uh, in their first 48 hours uh, uh, joined with the ear test, the hearing test, uh, they all newborn should undergo an evaluation of uh, its frenulum, uh, mostly looking at um, breastfeeding and breathing. 
Um, uh, this gives the hospital um, a score for quality uh, uh, and for, for um, the impact in the national health system. This is theory. In practice, in practice, unfortunately, the uh, the oral evaluation is not performed routinely, mostly because uh, mostly because the the newborn uh, is not evaluated always in the hospital, but it goes to an outstanding outside clinic, and they just do the uh, um, auto emission just for the hearing test. So you you don't have any anyone um, who is aware that this baby has not still been seen. I'm working at a university hospital. I should have all disciplines present at this university hospital. But this also is not true because you do not have uh, uh, this much people to look at everybody in a multidisciplinary way. So what should we be quite aware of? I think similar, probably Dr. Botze is still remembering, uh, as ENTs, we had been performing surgery of the tonsils for a lot of years. And we did not look at breathing, if the child was would be breathing afterwards or not through the nose. This was not my interest. My interest was just looking at big tonsils and perform the surgery. Uh, we also did not look at any craniofacial aspects, not routinely. This was not my problem. This should be the problem of the other one. Uh, and I think this is changing. This is changing already in residency, in, in the specialization courses. The ENT now is trained to look at craniofacial aspects. Is, look, is trained to look at some more functional aspects and not only at, at the anatomic structures. The Tong Tai, in the history of, of ENT, I think has been put out as a bad guy, as not necessary to be seen, again, as a bad guy, again, and not necessarily to be seen. So they are, uh, uh, it is, coming up and down in, in different time frames. Uh, I think now we have the vision uh, that multidisciplinary evaluation is the most important for every patient. And even if I am not a speech language therapist, or even if I'm not a, a nutritional specialist, I have to look at some aspects. So I can send early and can improve quality of life of this patient, and I can improve the treatment outcome. So I'm very hopeful. I, 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 I believe, I really believe that we are, we are walking uh, for a more multidisciplinary um, life in, in, in all aspects for health assistance that we really look at what the others are doing and that we will include it. It has to be. Great points. Easy. Absolutely. It has to be easy, fast, and, can, and, and it should be executable by everybody. What are our problems? I think the severe form is not difficult to be diagnosed. Everyone will see, the pediatrician will see, everyone will see. The mother will see. The mild form or the normal one. Also, no one will have any doubt because you won't have any problems. The problem is, as Robin said, as, as Michelle said, are the moderate ones because they are the vast majority. That's a Gauss distribution. Uh, and you don't know to which side they are tending. So in most of them, it is not possible to give a good diagnosis in one evaluation. You have to look several times. 
you have to look how the child is 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 developing. Robin, did you want to um, ask a question? Oh, unmute yourself, Robin. I have this question of the ENTs on the panel and anyone else who would like to um, reply. You know, oftentimes we see babes who have either moderate or even severe recessed jaw or babes where there is some suggestion of tongue-based obstruction. And there is this argument about whether or not in that context, you release the tongue or not, whether in fact, releasing would improve the situation or whether releasing would in fact make the situation worse. And I would love to hear you all um, comment on that because this is a argument, a debate I'm having with my physicians all the time. Are you talking about glossoptosis that the tongue will fall? No. Even, um, yes, glossoptosis or even just mild intermittent tongue base obstruction, not necessarily yeah, involved with a syndrome. If you see mandibular retrusion, even in utero, um, it, it's just, it's going to persist. And if you see it in childhood, um, the, my goal is to optimize the transverse dimension because always uh, a, a retrusive mandible is associated with a narrow maxilla. And so releasing the tongue doesn't have this direct effect on the mandible, in my opinion. I don't, there's nothing published on this, but um, if you optimize, uh, you know, the, the maxilla width and, and uh, the, the tongue possibility to live up there, it's going to make it easier for that mandible to grow just like you know, if a shoe is too narrow for a foot, if you widen the shoe, the foot is going to have more room to grow and, and get to the end. But you always later on have to bring, do something with that sagittal, usually with a functional appliance. They, they seldom grow on their own forward. And I think releasing the tongue is beneficial to a retrusive mandible because it's widening, you know, the shoe for the foot. The tongue being, you know, or the, the mandible being the foot. If that's a sound analogy, McNamara from the University of Michigan, orthodontist, he uses that analogy all the time. Well, I think this is, you know, certainly as you see it going forward in childhood, that is absolutely consideration. But early on, there's this debate of, are we making the airway worse or better? By I, mean, so I don't think it makes it worse. I don't think there's any evidence to say that the tongue falls into the airway. It may happen, it may happen because there are at least two case reports of glossophthosis following surgery of releasing the tongue. And whenever a child has a retrusive mandible and tongue posture on a newborn, let's say they are not eating well and you cannot expect their uh, growth to be optimal, they'll get into another vicious cycle where they are not gaining enough weight, like in a pyrubin sequence. They are not gaining enough weight, not enough energy. Their muscle tone is, is diminishing, and then they will develop this uh, airway problem. So I am very, very careful on a newborn who has a receded lower jaw, and in the very first days of life, I would wait to see how things are going, maybe supplement and not necessarily uh, breastfeed, and then see how things are getting better. And I want to say something about Michelle. Uh, not only the child is, is an issue when we come to assess the correct timing. I think the family that is surrounding this child is another thing. And the mother and what's her situation getting into, what's her milk supply? There are so many issues about it. And I think on our future guidelines, we should have this, who's the person to be the team leader of a newborn and of older ages. And unfortunately, most of the world doesn't have Michelle Emmanuel next to them. <laughs> so we can't really, and for me, we say that medicine is an art or so I'm uh, depending on my experience and maybe this is what makes me see things a bit different than people that have a little bit less experience. And there are babies that would look exactly the same, but the story, the familiar, familiar story is different. 
and the function that I see is different. And where is the, the golden point to, to intervene is very, very, uh, this is the question. And I would love them. This is one of the reasons that I love pre-surgical uh, treatment. It's not necessary to run into the treatment, into the surgery at the very first days. However, we have it at our hospital. We are very fortunate to have this uh, new uh, clinic where we are a multidisciplinary team. And now I can get to rely mostly on the lactation consultant, which are, we also have a lot of experience by this time. And it, my life is easier. And Silky, you said that it's very difficult to assess it during the very first few days of life. So the team approach, this is it. And building a team is such a big problem. And then when you get to see one member of the team, what about the speech pathologist? Who's gonna pay for the, for the evaluation? And then it's a, an economic issue. So in my understanding, it should be kind of a institutional team where they, the, the fees are being paid to a certain place and then the patient do not need to burn, to have the burden on them. I don't know, it's every uh, medical system is different. So I do hope in Israel we'll be able to make something uh, from what I see, Brazil has great uh, source for science coming out for with Roberta Martinelli and the team. Uh, but we still have a lot of things to do. I still don't know what's how to appeal to the common ENT. So because they've been brought up on one direction and we have no idea how to appeal to their understanding. To, to that end, I wanna uh, connect a couple of the dots here. Um, uh, in our discussion preparing for this panel this week, we talked about the Anna Mesner, uh, it's the clinical consensus statement on ankyloglossia in children, which came up and was published about two, almost two years ago by the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, which is really kind of like the leading body for ENTs around the world. <clears throat> it becomes a, a, a de facto, uh, you know, seal of approval. And uh, to connect that to something, you know, Robin was saying, Kevin was saying, Ayal, Michelle, the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, there are people who want to push this needle forward. And uh, to that end, I was asked to help program uh, a, a symposium on tethered oral tissues, uh, an acronym TOTS that Kevin actually uh, created. And we had a con group, uh, sort of like, whoa, slow down maybe tongue ties, not that serious. And, you know, we need more research and, you know, let's not worry about these kids so much. And Anna Mesner was leading that charge. And uh, in the pro group, we had a y'all, uh, Samantha, um, we had uh, Gina Weissman, a lactation consultant from Israel. Um, we had uh, Bobby Gehari, Shannon Sullivan, a pediatric sleep specialist from Stanford and um, Audrey Yoon, an orthodontist. And, you know, it was just overwhelmingly clear that there was so much more that needed to be done to overcome like this obstacle of a consensus statement. And what, you know, I want to challenge people who are remaining here. And I see Samantha, you just pulled up James Murphy, uh, who has been a part of our group and team and faculty as well. And he's uh, one of the pioneering leaders for, uh, uh, frenulum inspection and revision. You may have heard of the Murphy maneuver, um, but uh, we need to to ask each other what do we need? You know, Silky, you've helped create consensus statements and position papers. You know, uh, Robin, you the group I'm going in the room. we need uh, to to what do we need to go forward? I know it's data, uh, but uh, this is something that's an important challenge, and and you know maybe Silky. Uh, you could you could start with a comment on that, and you know I'd lo love to hear what people have to think because this will move the needle. American Academy of Pediatrics guidance saying we need this at birth, we need this at one year. You know, there's X prevalence in the general population, so we need to answer data questions. You know, this is a, a absolutely a phenotype for sleep apnea. You know, what do we need to do? 
to make everyone aware. So Robin, you don't have to twist arms in the hallway in your hospital. You know, but Mark, um, you you know, I raised the idea of Messner, and at least um, I hear ENTs using Messner, that consensus statement, as a way to say, oh, no, don't do tongue ties, don't do lip ties, don't do all of that. So I think, you know, that is something uh, that we're dealing with. We need to figure out mm, what retort we have, what information we can give in a very quick and easy way to um, discuss this. You know, Messner, uh, was back in uh, 1990, is one of the first to publish a study saying the intervention in the newborn for tongue tie was beneficial in just about all cases. And she recommended that you should do it as early as possible. Now she's running around saying, well, it's not really that bad. And uh, uh, wound care after release is ridiculous. It just causes pain. Don't do that. Uh, she started out being one of the pioneers pushing, and now she's one of the ones pulling on the rope to stop the, the, the forward progress. Uh, and as far as the comment of uh, medicine is an art, we have damn, too many damn Jackson Pollocks in, in the, the art of medicine, and we need some more Picassos or uh, modernist uh, painters to actually bring us an alignment to agree that there is a functional impairment. So I, I use Michelle's uh, arguments all the time that it's function, function, function. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what type it is. Uh, I don't, what's submucosal? It, show me one that doesn't have any mucosa on it. Are you kidding me? You know, all these terms are, draw, are pulling us back. We need to go with function and we need to tell the parents that the, tongue, the child's tongue's function is what's impaired. And we can improve this to some extent with non-surgical means, but sometimes we need surgical means to finish the job. So as long as we keep pushing function, 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 and we can document what the function is, I think we can get people singing off the same sheet of music. Maybe that's- Very well said. I unmuted myself to say that exact thing. <laughs> and so, yes. <laughs> Jim, let's get back together, please. Let's get back together, Jim. Um, we used to lecture together and it was always so much fun, but I agree. We're going to have to correct though for the level of dysfunction because some babies are going to be mildly impacted. Some babies are going to be moderately impacted and some are going to be significantly impacted. And this can be shown by a functional assessment with someone with the trained eyes and ears. So if we correct for that, then we can see. But the reason why we're getting this pushback, and I'm happy for the pushback because it's slowing everything down. And for me, honestly, the train has been rolling too fast. We're going too fast to phrenectomy, not, we're bypassing function. We're um, thinking that the release and we're letting parents think that the release is the thing that really fixes things. It isn't, it's a part, it's a necessary 12% of the 100. Where we put it is super important. The sooner the better, as long as it takes to get the function so that the baby is able to have a good outcome. This is the other thing. This is not just a, we get to do this and it always works. There's a whole wound care process behind this. And that does throw a monkey wrench. But with the pushback we got was because we're getting a lot of suboptimal outcomes and pediatricians are seeing babies coming back looking the same or worse. And they've gone through this whole big thing. And so we do need to be better about how we do this. And the other thing is that there has been a lot of problems with wound care. We have gotten scars. We have gotten a, a worse outcome from that. And we've had parents with PTSD from this. And wound care principles go, uh, they're paradoxical to gentle parenting. And most of the people that come to this are. And one other thing, and I, I will say enough, there are two different kinds of babies. And this is what AOMT understands. And this is why this problem is so vast. On the one hand, there's Katrina's babies, there's Robin's babies. I spent nine years working in a NICU myself. I know that world and I love that world, but I'm not in that world anymore. It's those babies, the medically fragile, the acute, the babies with a known diagnosis, a congenital anomaly that's been named, and these other things. There's all those babies with like restrictions and dysfunction. And then there's my caseload, which is the passed over. Um, undiagnosed, baby with toricolis and breastfeeding problems and a mom with chewed off nipples that's not getting identified as anything 
Okay. That's my entire caseload. I don't see preemies anymore. I get one in, one in a while. Okay. But I have typically developing full-term babies that are not identified and their pediatricians are saying, Pasha. Okay. So there's two different babies here. I'm in this world now and Robin's in this world. That's why we have both of us. So we can encapsulate and, and make this expansive for everybody. And you guys, um, the Murphy maneuver, if you don't know it, get in touch with me or Dr. Jim, because I use that. And that's what I have parents, how they get on board with this whole thing is the Murphy maneuver. Just sweep Jim, across. I think, I think you need to explain what it is yeah. because people will benefit. I'm on a continuous antibiotic infusion and my pump is telling me change bag. <clears throat> Oh, no. uh, I, I missed last week because I was in the hospital for endocarditis. Oh, goodness. <clears throat> yeah. So I didn't even call it this. I was demonstrating at a meeting that the way I find and prove to parents that there is a midline obstruction is that I take my little finger, I place it pad down on the left side of the baby's mouth, and push back till I get some resistance so that I know I'm back far enough to get a good assessment. Then I sweep to the other side and I assess what's the level of obstruction to my finger going from one side to the other. If there's very little obstruction, then there's a low likelihood that any surgical release is going to be of benefit. But if there's moderate or severe restriction of movement, this has a very, very high beneficial outcome to a surgical release. And uh, I've put out videos, uh, Bobby Gehari has put out videos to show that you don't have to do a big surgical procedure. My, my teaching is that I look at where the, uh, the caruncle is, where the, the two uh, salivary glands come together I go two millimeters above that, so there's no danger to damaging those ducts. I make a snip two millimeters in depth, just two millimeters, and pop them, put that in. And that makes a teeny tiny little diamond that doesn't do anything. But for me, I take a, a two by two gauze pad, place it over the right side of that tiny little diamond, push very gently and rotate 45 degrees. A 45 degrees pops that open to a 10 millimeter diamond without causing any floor of the mouth disturbance. I found when it went 90 degrees, it pulled on the floor of the mouth and sometimes you ended up with a little hematoma right behind the, the gingival ridge. Then you place the gauze pad on the left side and rotate 45 degrees to the left, you end up with that four millimeter diamond coming up to a 10 to 12 millimeter diamond. Actually, sometimes it's gotten even larger. Uh, the baby pulls the tongue up and pops it open even more and that releases it. Now, the whole point was that when we released it, the tongue function became normal because there was no restriction. And the goal is to prevent that restriction from returning. Sometimes, just breastfeeding is all you need. You don't need any, any maneuvers at all and, and they recover beautifully. But more often than not, it starts to tighten up. And so if you do just a very gentle once a day maneuver to lift the tongue up and restrict, release any tiny little restrictions before they become big restrictions, you can get a really, really good outcome. But in my office that I had for four years where I just dealt with breastfeeding babies, what I found is latching the baby to the breast is a, it's a normal thing for many babies, but for the babies who were tongue-tied, they've never had a normal attachment. We've got to teach them what the normal attachment is. The mother's never experienced normal attachment. She doesn't know how to do that. And I found it took four to five visits to teach both the baby and the mother to get a deep, comfortable, productive milk transfer uh, latch, uh, which is what we're all looking for. It took that long to teach mom and baby how to do this. So in the, the office that I previously had, I was allowed one visit to release and two 20 minute follow-ups. It just doesn't, wasn't enough to get everybody doing well. So I, I can't overemphasize how many times we have to work with mom in order to perfect that latch 
We can't just release it. And the biggest problem I found, and the main reason I closed my office, is that the dentists in my area were sending out flyers, hiring people to call everybody and get all the patients to come in to get their $100,000 laser release of tongue tie with no follow-up and no lactation support. So mothers were very, very happy with the lactation, with the, the, the laser release, but then they wondered, well, what now? And so we don't know the outcome of those because nobody followed them. Nobody studied it. We don't know. But I, I saw an awful lot of those babies back in my office to finish the job. So the emphasis has to be to stay with the mother. If the goal is to get this baby breastfeeding, you must stay with the mother until she reports that breastfeeding is going really well. And it takes four to five visits, in my experience, to do that. And who's going to pay for that? This is a problem. And the myofunctional therapy before and after is highly valuable for, I, I found highly valuable for the older kids. I'm still not sure exactly how much benefit we get in, in newborns or uh, extremely you know, under one year, under old. Okay, you, but let's, I, let's okay. resist the urge to devalue the services that we're here talking about, you guys. Yeah. We're here talking about OMDs and babies and how they impact the rest of their lives. We need yeah. to start valuing this service and people can pay for it. it. We need to charge reasonable rates, but we do need parents to change, exchange resources of some value for these services and they're highly valuable. So we have to come at it like we, we need to make it affordable. We also need to make as much free, but also um, I can't work for free. Right. That's all very valid. And of course, every country, every, I mean, here Katrina is coming in with the NHS on the other side of the coin. And what did you yeah. want to add to that, Katrina? Um, I, I just want to pick up on um, actually, you know, tongue tie release happening in newborns. I work with older children too, where you know, you know, the problems they might have had the tongue tie release surgery and, and gone ahead with that, but they come through with further problems. And I think that it is a changeable feast through through life. And it's not just focusing on the tiny ones. That is really, really important, but it's also looking at, okay, how it affects breathing speech and those other experiences and you know many children you know from a cost saving point of view keeping a child on a, a tube and I have about 15 20 children on my caseload who are on tubes because they need a release it costs 25,000 pounds a year to keep them on that and actually we're looking at cost saving one appointment two appointments four appointments to meet with the therapist that, that's a big saving and there's currently one mum who doesn't know where to go because we don't have a, a setup service over here um, and uh, you, you know she she'll pay but we, right. we just, I just don't have place to send her just Jeff. I want to circle back to a question that I asked what do we need and I was talking to Silky what do we need to change all this. We know we have solutions. All, all of these panelists, probably all 200 plus people on this call, we have solutions. We can change these people's lives. And I wanted to deliver a message from Roberta Martinelli, who's sorry she couldn't join us, but she you know, did her PhD on a validated protocol for frenulum inspection for newborns, which Ayal uses, which so many people use. We teach, uh, so many people use around the world. And she said, we need to, really focus on the data. We need to get data that we can deliver and make change unavoidable. So we don't have Mesner, you know, consensus statements, you know, being used to turn away patients or to turn away care. And we need to really think about a new definition for ankyloglossia. It's not just a short freedom. It's not, because it, any restriction of the tongue is going to lead to changes in craniofacial morphology, problems with swallowing, problems with speech. You know, it's, it's a much bigger issue and we need to approach it from this holistic sense. 
it's a it's going to lead to sleep disorders and it's not only you know what could be uh, adhering in the in the in the back of the tongue the middle of the tongue these are all people compensate lifting up the floor of their mouth um and silky i, I know you were going to maybe ma uh, mention something so Roberta uh, said she wants to support all of us in this work around the world, and she's one of our team. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think all these outcomes you mentioned, sleep, craniofacial growth, uh, mastication, breathing, uh, neurocognitive development, everything, um, they are. And this is what we have to keep in mind. They are always multifactorial, and have to be seen multidisciplinary. So what is frightening when you just come with one of these factors? People will think that this is overdriven, that this is uh, super valorized. So uh, um, I think this is my opinion. I think this is what we are working and what you are looking and what you are dreaming of. Uh, you have to make more and more uh, assured that you have to work in a multidisciplinary form. One, and I think uh, all consensus, if you look at the Messner consensus, you have pediat pediatric ENTs, but only pediatric ENTs. You don't have any other. So consensus also has to be driven by a multidisciplinary team. You are actually building up one. So this is important. We also have to look, all our decisions in academy are driven on what is called best evidence. Best evidence uh, has been uh, based or, or has been uh, uh, said that, would, would that, that, that it had been made by clinical, by randomized clinical trials. These, these data would give best evidence. We are changing this. We know that not only randomized clinical trials are good to give you good evidence. Real life studies are more important. Real life studying, including quality of life, including patients' opinion are more important than randomized trials. So this is a tendency that is coming up now very hard. And this is where we have to work on. What are the problems with all this evaluation? It, it is not enough if I only evaluate ankyloglossia. I have to evaluate mastication. I have to evaluate also the breathing status. I have to know what the craniofacial status is now because all of these aspects will influence all of our outcomes, all of the list of outcomes that, that, that you said and that everybody is pointing out. So I really appreciate that. And it does really summarize there's, you know, as clinicians, we're always struggling against what our caseload can represent, but these case studies and these stories that are born out of these outcomes, I think that is really important for us all to hear. And it might be an imperative and a motivator to get more formalized case studies um, inside your clinics, um, something where you can really start to evaluate outcomes and where the therapy and the outcomes are coming over time. See, we have to follow these cases as well. We are coming up to our time here. I wanna make sure if, um, I appreciate all the ch chats and the comments here. It's a, a very dynamic discussion. I know a lot of you are providers. You are stepping in, you are giving what your patients need and you are doing the multidisciplinary approach. So what we're trying to do is expand that level of care into the world essentially. And of course there are hurdles. Before we close, does anyone want to make some comments? Robin, do you have anything you wanna say? No, I just, I really think that we've all come together 
and it's so important to hear all of the multidisciplinary procedures. Um, and I think, you know, as we work together in the future, we're going to be able to make changes that really help our, our patients over their lifespan. Absolutely. And I've saved the chat uh, so we can reflect on it. And I really appreciate all of you coming here today. And so we're putting our heads together. And if you have ideas in the meantime of what you think would be the next bridge or this all was started because Ayal wanted to present to his ENT community and it spawned a lot of discussion and question and the hurdles that we face as clinicians and researchers. So I would love to hear from you um, following this up. This is meant to be a workshop and a collaborative idea session as well. We're gonna work on this elevator pitch. You'll be hearing from me um, to see how we can get that moving forward. But I think it's really important to see how many of us are engaged, invested, passionate, and have dedicated our lives to this work. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for everything you do, wherever you are in the world. Um, if anyone doesn't want to say anything, uh, I want to say, hey, please go yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. I want to say thank you. And the fact that it arose so much uh, interest in so many people and made me see some of you guys that I really miss you. Uh, and we need to work on putting the subject onto the curricula of the professionals, all of them, medical, dental, uh, paramed paramedical, and so on. And if anyone has any relation or any connection with those fields, they should do their best. And of course, the multi multidisciplinary teams are being made locally. One of these days, it's gonna be a kind of a cleft tip, a, a cleft palate team. Everyone knows who is on that cleft, on that team. So we'll change the world one tongue at a time or one myofunctional dis <laughs> uh, disorder at a time. Thank you. Great. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for being here. Um, we will see you in the future. Thank you for coming. We will share this um, somehow soon. Okay, everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.